Hey students, this presentation is going to teach you about the history of life, how scientists think life began, and how it changes. First, let's discuss what early Earth was like. So as you can see in this image here, early Earth had lots of volcanoes, lots of lightning, and it didn't really look exactly like Earth did today. It was hot, volcanic, and it was anaerobic. Anaerobic means there was no oxygen available on early Earth. Scientists think the first living things on Earth were anaerobic bacteria. The first living things were probably very simple, so bacteria are simple, and since there was no oxygen available, the bacteria would need to be anaerobic since they don't need to use oxygen. Another way of saying this is the bacteria would be anaerobic prokaryotes because prokaryote is the same thing as bacteria. So now scientists want to look at where living things came from. There are two options for where living things came from. The first option is abiogenesis, which is also known as spontaneous generation. It's the idea that living things come about randomly from non-living things. Bio means alive, abio means not alive. Whenever you put a in front of something, it means not. Genesis means, means to make. So biogenesis means to make living things from living things, but abiogenesis means to make living things from non-living things. A long time ago, some people used to think that you could take a dirty shirt and wheat, leave it for 21 days, and make rice, or make mice. So dirty shirts and wheat are not alive, however mice are. So that would be an example of abiogenesis. Biogenesis is the idea that living things only come from other living things. Bio means alive, genesis means to make. So this is the idea that living things come from other things that are alive. Like this baby lion came from the, the mother lion, which is also alive. So there's some scientists that wanted to test the idea of abiogenesis. Miller and Urey were two scientists that made this contraption to the right, and they carried out an experiment that simulated the atmosphere of early Earth. They mixed together gases that they thought were present on early Earth, and then they shocked them with electricity. Both the gases and the electricity are not alive, but they were able to make the building blocks of life known as amino acids. So Miller and Urey wanted to figure out if the lightning shocking the gases could have triggered abiogenesis, making the building blocks of life, like amino acids, without adding anything that was alive. So Miller and Urey did not use oxygen in their experiment because there was no oxygen on early Earth. The shocks of electricity in their experiment represented the shocks of lightning on early Earth. Reddy was another scientist that performed an experiment on where living things come from. He carried out a meat and maggot experiment to show that living things do not come from spontaneous generation. Basically, he set up two jars with meat inside, and he wanted to show that the maggots, or baby flies, don't come from meat. They come from flies. So he had a control group, which was just a jar with meat that had no cover on it, and then his experimental group had a jar with meat with a cover on it. And so he proved that after leaving this for a couple of days, maggots would appear, but maggots would only appear if the flies were able to get into the jar. And so there were actually maggots on the top of the covered jar, and that proved that those maggots came from the flies, not from the meat itself. Pasteur was another scientist who tested where living things come from. He carried out a broth and flask experiment to show that microorganisms, or bacteria, do not come about from spontaneous generation. He boiled this broth in this flask, and he actually left it for weeks and weeks and weeks, and the broth never rotted. No bacteria ever grew. However, when he broke off the neck of the flask, um, bacteria were able to fall into the broth from the air, and now the microorganisms um, can grow. So he proved that bacteria don't come from non-living things, they come from bacteria that are living in the air, or come from somebody's mouth if they cough, or things like that. So now let's talk about how living things evolve. Evolve means change over time. There's two major ideas about how living things evolve, Lamarck's theory and Darwin's theory. Lamarck came up with the idea of inheritance of acquired characteristics. This is the idea that parents can acquire traits during their lifetime and pass those acquired traits on to their offspring. So for example, he had the idea that if somebody worked out and had big muscles, they could pass those big muscles on to their kids. In the same way, giraffes could stretch their necks and then pass on stretched necks to their kids. But we know that's not the truth. We know that you can only pass on things to your kids that are coded in your genes. Darwin came up with the idea of natural selection. Natural selection is the idea that all organisms in a population are not the same. Some organisms have traits that help them better able to survive and reproduce, and they will pass those traits on to their offspring. 
Organisms without those beneficial traits will die off over time because they can't compete with the more fit organisms. So for example, some of these bugs were lucky and were born with a brown color. Now you can't force yourself to be a brown bug, you're just born that way. The birds are better able to see the green bugs because they stand out against the brown wood. So the brown ones are camouflaged, they're less likely to get eaten. So over time the population is going to change to weed out the green bugs, the birds are going to eat them. This is like survival of the fittest. The brown bugs are the fittest because they can hide and escape the birds. Here's another example of natural selection. These are peppered moths. As you can see, this peppered moth is able to camouflage or blend into its environment. Um, during the Industrial Revolution, pollution from factories dirtied the trees, making the bark darker. And so now the darker moths had an advantage over the light moths. They were better camouflaged. And so the proportion or the percentage of dark moths actually increased after the Industrial Revolution because now the dark moths could blend in on the trees. Finally, let's discuss where eukaryotes came from. This is the endosymbiont theory. It's the theory that a large cell without a nucle excuse me, a large cell with a nucleus engulfed or swallowed a smaller bacteria that began to live inside the larger cell. So if the bacteria were able to do cell respiration, those bacteria lived inside of this big bacterium and they almost acted like mitochondria. And then later that cell also swallowed photosynthetic bacteria that could do things like photosynthesis and they um, would be the ancestors of chloroplasts.